We are living in the last month of 2023, but last but not least, SpaceX is still promised to have another Starship orbital flight test this year. Starship Flight 3 hardware should be ready to fly in three to four weeks. Although this is based on Elon Musk's time with all current positive signs, SpaceX Starship IFT-3 is coming faster than you might think. Discuss everything about this in today's episode of TechMap. But before we begin, our team extends a warm welcome. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and enable notifications to stay up to date with the latest news from SpaceX and the world of space. With that in mind, let's jump straight into today's episode. For those of you who haven't been living under a rock, you already know Starbase was just decorated with a new sign, Gateway to Mars. Well, now the visitor to this spaceport city can have one more place to take selfies. And that is just one of many notable updates in Starbase ahead of IFT-3. So, anything else? First of all, let's take a look at Stage 0, including the tank farm, OLM and launch tower. The orbital tank farm is currently in the process of getting a new set of clothes. Indeed, SpaceX has been working on replacing existing vertical tanks with more advanced horizontal designs. Since November 27, the media has recorded images of large horizontal cryotankers approaching the launch site. On November 30, there were five out of nine new cryotanks being delivered and installed. This is a significant expansion to the tank farm in preparation for IFT-3. It's great to see things getting bigger and bigger in Starbase. Among four types of cryogenic liquids classified in the tank farm, including liquid methane, liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen, and water, the cryogenic liquid methane was transferred to the horizontal tanks adjacent to the original GSE tanks a long time ago, and this time, SpaceX plans to move gradually the remaining ones to the new horizontal tanks. The reason for this change is through flight tests. SpaceX began to realize the disadvantages of vertical tanks. Because of their high height, they easily suffer shockwaves during the rocket's flight. As you can see, there are many dents on the external shell of the two closest tanks to the pad, and it would be dangerous if there were any leaks here. To be honest, those vertical tanks might be one of the major mistakes that SpaceX has made. Next, for OLM, we recorded workers reinstalling the booster's stabilizing pins onto the launch pad. It is one of the minimal required post-launch works to be ready for the later flight tests. As SpaceX's statement, the water-cooled flame deflector and other pad upgrades performed well, so the damage was not significant. On November 20, Musk shared some photos taken beneath the launch mount, reflecting its great condition. He said there was no need to refurbish the water-cooled steel plate for the next launch. Yes, what a great success this launch was. Of course, once the water deluge system works well, it means not only the ground system, but also around infrastructure is protected better. From a distance, we can see that the area around SpaceX's installation site looks clean and airy. There were small debris and pieces of concrete, but nothing significant, which were cleaned up very quickly after launch. SpaceX workers must really like this because they can escape the horror that happened a few months ago which contained a sinkhole and piles of debris everywhere. Both the FAA and FWS will be pleased to see this. The less serious the aftermath, the less complicated the environmental assessment. Despite this, the OLM legs also need some attention. Zoom in, and we will see the words cracks marked by workers. Perhaps they analyze the story to make corrections and find ways to improve its structure. In addition, we also noticed some tiny damages in the other parts, such as the outermost tank of the water deluge system, which provides pressure and water to the deluge plate, the upper ship quick disconnect, and the booster quick disconnect situated on top of the orbital launch mount. Overall, they all looked quite burned in response to the rocket engine's shockwave, but their losses seemed to be not severe. So I'm pretty sure the time to recover all of them is not long. Okay, the ground jobs are done, it's time to look up to the sky. The Ship 25 and Booster 9 Duo had an impressive performance when everything from the takeoff phase to the hot staging separation was really smooth. The ship then reached outer space and almost completed its full-time burn. This is completely opposite to what happened with the pair of Ship 24 and Booster 7 when they were destroyed less than four minutes after lifting off prior to stage separation. 
Following its predecessor, Ship 28 and Booster 10 are scheduled to be in IFT-3, and both of them are in preparation for their own static fire test campaigns. Besides, Starbase is also quite busy preparing the vehicles that are coming down the line right after that for Flights 4, 5, and so on. Ship 28 has the final TPS completed before being cleared to proceed to the launch site by Hopper. By applying the iterative method, there are several other prototypes of Starship born, not only serving for the later actual tests, but also for the Starship V2's development. Previously, on November 20, at least two super heavy boosters were visible from public roadways near SpaceX's facility in South Texas. Booster 11 arrived at the production site after undergoing cryo-testing at Massey's. Booster 10 had passed this milestone and was placed onto the engine installation stand in Mega Bay. Perhaps work on the OLM is still continuing, so there haven't been any static fire tests of the S-28 or B-10 on it yet. But don't worry, they will take place soon since, as I said, the amount of refurbishment work on OLM is not much. Those are reports from SpaceX's side, so how about the national agencies like the FAA and FWS? As a mandatory task after each rocket launch, the FWS conducted an assessment of Boca Chica, Texas. Some small pieces of debris were observed but are easily removable, a representative for FWS said in a statement. The main impact noticed by staff was to the tidal flats, which occurred when the public entered the area for several hours to watch the launch, the representative added. Foot traffic, chairs, and off-leash dogs can impact this sensitive habitat. To handle this problem, FWS said that it will work with SpaceX to educate the public on preserving the flats, as well as potentially coming up with alternative viewing locations for the public to watch the next launch. Regarding the FAA after the orbital flight of S-25 and B-9, the FAA shared that an incident occurred in IFT-2 leading to the loss of the vehicle. But no injuries or damage to public property were reported. The national agency will oversee SpaceX's mishap investigation to ensure SpaceX complies with the FAA-approved mishap investigation plan and other regulatory requirements. It appears that this is primarily a SpaceX investigation with oversight by the FAA perhaps involving discussions and agreements regarding licensing requirement restrictions and offsets. Anyway, Elon Musk and his company this time can wind down more because the consequences of IFT2 in the environment are not serious. Unlike last time when the explosion on OLM was the main culprit that dragged SpaceX into a series of troubles with government agencies and local environmental organizations, and once you get caught up in government bureaucracy, your work will take a lot of time to process. In fact, to bring Starship back to the sky in November this year, SpaceX had to show extremely tough actions such as taking advantage of the power of media and public opinion, speaking up at the hearing in October to urge the FAA to act more quickly. Obviously, once the situation is developing in a positive direction as at present, obtaining a third launch license is certainly not difficult to achieve. Thanks to that, Elon Musk's prediction of an early launch date for IFT-3 will become a reality. Of course, that is just my opinion. If you have any comments, don't hesitate to leave them in the comments section below for everyone to discuss. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification feature so you don't miss any space important updates. Your support is our driving force to continue delivering high quality content. Thank you and we look forward to seeing you next time 